as we come to, to this course, uh, this class, Old Testament Studies 1, and then following up with Old Testament Studies 2 and New Testament Studies, has a role to play within the, the greater direction as far as the curriculum is concerned. We are not going to do everything as far as study of the Bible is concerned because you have many other courses that uh, you'll be taking, all that come together in the end for the ultimate purpose of the Master's Seminary, and that is to prepare you to be expositors of Scripture. And uh, Dr. MacArthur made that very eloquent uh, uh, statement yesterday as far as his total message was concerned. And then at the very end, he read that, uh, that illustration of what a pastor should be, a student of the Scripture. And, uh, and this is the reason for our existence as a seminary, to prepare men to preach and teach the Word of God, believing that uh, all of uh, the rest of the pastoral responsibilities that uh, you will entail as you get into ministry will flow from and be directed by your understanding and your communication of the Scripture, that uh, truly the Bible is at the center and the foundation of uh, what we do as men of God. And you're reminded of that yesterday in, in chapel. And uh, there, realize you are dedicating yourself to a lifelong study of the Scripture. And I, I share with classes that the last thing on my radar as uh, God directed me in the ministry, was uh, teaching in a seminary. Uh, it was not my desire. It was not my goal. My desire and goal in going to seminary was to prepare to be a pastor who would uh, exposit God's word. And... Uh, and that's what I tell students. I am a pastor who happens now to teach in a seminary. And I'm sure as you get into the class, you'll probably realize that I am more pastor than seminary professor. I have been known at times to, to go off and preach a sermon at you. Um, I will try to reframe myself as much as possible, although students sometimes say that is the best part of the class. Um, um, in fact, I, I had a graduate who, uh, actually it was, it was a student who was sent by a graduate. And uh, this student came in and said, do you remember so-and-so? And so the guilty will not be further stated. I won't give you the name. I said, oh yeah, I remember him very, very well, you know, from class. In fact, he, uh, he was in this classroom and sat, you know, right about there most of, most of the time. And he said, uh, well, you know, he told me that uh, when I took your class to make sure to get you off on tangents and make you preach. <laughs> and I said, one of the alumni is telling students to get me off of the notes and get me preaching? He said, yeah. He said, that was the best part of the class. Uh, so I sent that student, uh, I mean the alumni, an email and said, what are you telling the students to do? I'm trying to get more disciplined and stay to the notes and make sure we communicate what is supposed to be communicated. And here you're telling students as they're coming to get me off of the notes and get me preaching because that's the best part of the class. Um, so that is the reputation. It all comes from the fact that, uh, you know, I am at heart a pastor and believe that at this season of my life, God has me here for no other reason than to train men who are going to be pastors and preachers. And uh, there's a certain sense in which uh, every year of graduation, 
I, uh, I feel a sense of spiritual envy for those of you who are graduating and going to be expositing the scripture within the context of a local church each week. Uh, I do that at a certain level uh, in my life of ministry today, but uh, uh, not in the same way and with uh, the same amount of, uh, of joy that I had when it uh, was being a pastor shepherding a flock within a local congregation. And, uh, and so as we come to, to this course, uh, a lot of, of what uh, and how it is, has been formed flows from pastoral ministry. Uh, even when we get into some of the issues within the individual books of Scripture, Sometimes I will say, now, this is an academic issue, all right? And since we're an academic institution and you're going to face this in other uh, classes here at the seminary and certainly as you get into, into ministry, because there will always be those academicians uh, that God will even put within a local church, then you should be aware of this discussion. Other times I will say, now, this is something that usually... The commentators don't get into as much, but this is a live issue within the church. Here's a place where you're going to have to come to a conclusion, at least by the time you preach this passage or preach this book, uh, because people are going to be anticipating that you have an answer to, uh, to the questions that uh, they will have. So I try to blend together the academic and the, uh, the practical and uh, lay a foundation both for your seminary studies, yet also we will talk at the very end of uh, this lecture time that uh, we will start talking even in this course about how what we are discussing uh, certainly will have an impact upon your preaching, both as you preach here in uh, seminary, and then as you go out into full-time ministry. I want to keep before us what is our ultimate goal, what is our ultimate focus, and that is we are learning ultimately to be able to communicate this and preach it to others. And uh, even in the seminary curriculum, for those of you on the three-year plan, once you, uh, once you complete these uh, three courses, uh, you will be going into... The, the expository preaching class. Even those of you on the four-year program, same thing. You complete these three classes in the order listed within the catalog, and the next step you take is getting into expository preaching. We'll actually go over and build upon uh, a number of the things that we talk about as far as this class is concerned. Now, as you come to this course, I'm well aware of the fact that you come from a, a multitude of backgrounds. In fact, there is really no one of you who is in, in exactly the same place as the other students within this class. Uh, if you are like uh, previous classes, and this is the 13th year that I have uh, taught this course, uh, there are a number of you that have been Christians uh, maybe no more than uh, five years as you are sitting here. Uh, there are some that will uh, confess that even though you have begun seminary, you have never begun in Genesis and read through the Bible to Revelation. Hopefully you've read some things here and there in the Bible, but you have never sat down in a disciplined, consistent way and started with Genesis and move progressively through the scripture until you came to Revelation. I didn't do that until uh, I'd been a Christian uh, nine years before I did that. I became a Christian at 10, and it wasn't until my, uh, uh, my sophomore year of college that I got challenged to read through the Bible in a year. And by that point, I realized God was calling me to seminary, and I thought it might be a good idea before I got to seminary to read all the way through the Bible, to make sure that no verse had gone unread 
at least, that might not be mastered by the time I got to seminary on the meaning of every verse of Scripture, but at least that I would have read through the totality of the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I did that in uh, my sophomore, junior year of, uh, of college and realized at the end of that year what a tremendous impact that it had upon my thinking and upon my life to read through the Bible. And I used one of those checkoff charts, went down to the Bible bookstore and got one of those charts about three chapters a day. And I was stunned, probably like you are, when you read through the Bible in a year, it's the middle of October before you get to the New Testament. And I had done 95% of my reading as a Christian where? Same place all Christians do their reading, in the New Testament. And now I'm going to read through the Bible. It's going to be October 15th before I get to the New Testament. And fortunately, I had a little bit of familiarity with uh, the Old Testament. Not enough, but, uh, <clears throat> but I, uh, I slogged through. And uh, actually, it was in the middle of Kings that I bought my first Christian book that I first went to the Christian bookstore and said, I need a book. And uh, I was lost in the Kings. Some of you will have that same experience around the first week of November. If you've never read Kings before, you're going to get lost in the Kings. But we're going we're gonna to help you find your way through uh, the Kings. But I was lost. And to this day, I look, on my li I look on my library shelf and remember the very first book that I bought as a sophomore in college. It was F.F. F. Bruce's Israel and the Nations. It was the only book they had at that time in, uh, in the 60s. I said, I need a book on Old Testament history. They only have one. Um, they had a lot of uh, pens and a lot of other trinkets in the Bible bookstore, but they only had one book on the history of Israel. And it was Bruce's book, Israel and the Nations. And I bought it. And uh, I read through it and uh, started to get an understanding of, of at least the, the flow of uh, the Old Testament. Now, you should know I've moved beyond Bruce. Bruce was a late dater. You'll find out what that is when we talk about the dating of the Exodus and the period of the judges. Um, he didn't, uh, he, he started with Israel, he started with them coming out of Egypt, didn't do a whole lot with, uh, with the patriarchs. Um, uh, I, I've since learned a lot more about the Bible than was in Bruce's book and uh, know the things that are valuable in Bruce's work and the things that are no longer. By the way, you notice that Bruce is not a requirement for this class. So I have moved and so will you move beyond F.F. F. Bruce's Israel the Nation. But that was the very first book that I got and the very first uh, uh, book in my, in my Christian life that I read outside of the Bible. And uh, my wife says, you haven't stopped buying books since. And she is right. It was the first, but I can certainly say it wasn't the last. But uh, we want to come and think in terms, all right, many other things that you will do in seminary, where do these classes fit in? And uh, you are now in or already taken hermeneutics. And uh, in hermeneutics, you're introduced to Bible study and the three steps of Bible study that uh, will follow you in this course, will follow you in your exegesis classes, will follow you as you get in to the preparation that you do for preaching. And that is the steps of observation, interpretation, and application. And uh, there is a sense in which we will do all three in this class in 502 and 601. Observation is simply becoming saturated with the particulars of the biblical text. Observing is seeing what is in the text. And uh, 
And that's your first goal. Your first goal in this course is to become acquainted with the Bible. Now, as I said, you all start at different places as far as your knowledge of the Bible already. Uh, some of you have never taken a Bible class. As I said, some of you have never read all the way through the Bible in a, in a consistent fashion. Some of you are Bible majors at the undergraduate level. Uh, you, you start at different places, yet there is a goal for all of us, and that is to become better acquainted with the content of the Bible than we were before this course began. You are not in competition with any other student in this class. You are to be a faithful steward of where you are as you begin the class before God, and you are to, on the foundation of where you are, read the scripture so that you might become more knowledgeable as far as the content of the Word of God is concerned. All of us will be reading the biblical text. And yet, as I said, we'll all be starting in different places. One of the things you want to do is, is you want to encourage one another. Those of you who know the Bible better, encourage students who might be going through it for the first time. Uh, in fact, if uh, you are a Bible major, don't spend all of your time with other Bible majors at the undergraduate level. Get to know some of the students who didn't have Bible and uh, encourage them and help them as uh, they start to move through the Word of God. And by the same token, uh, and I found this in seminary, that uh, it was real easy because I came from a secular college background and I came from a college in California to realize that within a month, the guys that I were hanging around had all graduated from either the University of California system or Cal State system here in California, and we all spoke the same language. Um, and it's real easy to, to be around students, either, even in seminary, who speak the same language. Well, get to know some of the students who don't speak the same language, and that was exciting for me to start to, uh, to get to know some men who, uh, who didn't come from California and uh, had had a, uh, a Christian college background instead of a secular college background. Uh, some of the, uh, we were younger, some of the students who were older, some of the students who'd actually been involved in ministry. In fact, the, uh, we had assigned seating in chapel and God and his sovereign plan put me next to a man who graduated from Bible college and been a pastor for 10 years before he came to seminary. And uh, he became one of my best friends. And, uh, and I was always talking to him about, well, what's it like to be a pastor? What's it like to preach this material? So, so broaden your horizons, help each other out. But we begin by observing the text. And in, in this course, it basically means reading the biblical text and reading the biblical text in huge chunks. And I can tell you right now, one of the tensions you will have in this class is the fact that I'm making you read a lot. And students will always say, I want to slow down and interact with, you know, just one verse and get a devotional thought and think through it, develop, you know, determine the meaning and application for my life. And my answer is, that's why we have Greek and Hebrew exegesis. That's when you'll slow down and really concentrate upon a verse. Our goal is to get the big picture, that meaning really is top down. And even in uh, the, uh, the elective exegesis classes, you will find out that sometimes a professor will tell you, now, before we start the exegesis of the class, what I want you to do over the summer or over Christmas before it 
before the exegesis class begins is read through the book. And one professor in one class asked his students to have the book read 50 times, once a day. 50 days before they came to the exegesis class. And uh, it was Professor McDougall on uh, Colossians. And you can read Colossians in about 20 minutes. He says, okay, take 20 minutes every day and read Colossians. And that's getting saturated with the particulars. All right, so here, the, uh, we're going to be reading huge chunks of the Bible. Now, a very simple observation as we begin as far as the content of the Bible is concerned, and that is, as we think in terms of Bible blocks, that is, blocks of material within the Bible, is that there is a basic two-fold division of the Bible. Now, I know you didn't come to seminary to have this observation thrown at you, that the Bible has two parts the Old Testament and the New Testament. But we do need to make that observation because for many people, their Bible is what? The New Testament. They forget that the Bible has two divisions. The Old Testament, which is 78% of the Bible. And the New Testament which is the final 22%. That's why when you read through it, you don't get to the New Testament until October. You're in to the last quarter of the year before you get to the New Testament. And so there is the, the Old Testament, and then there is the New Testament. And uh, there certainly are some some similarities and yet some differences between these two parts of the Bible. And uh, in one of the, the first of the charts that I uh, gave you for this course, you will, uh, you will note that the centerpiece of Scripture is the life of Jesus. It is the link between the Old and the New Testaments. And all of the Old Testament was written before Christ. In fact, it begins right around 1400 B.C. And the writing of the Old Testament concludes at approximately 400 B.C. The Old Testament is written over a period of a thousand years. It begins with the, the inaugural scripture, which uh, is the writing of Moses. That will begin as we look at the Old Testament on Friday. The, the Torah or the, the Pentateuch depending on whether you use the, the Hebrew or the Greek uh, designation. And goes all the way through to the, to the final writings, which uh, would include uh, chronicles, as far as the writings is concerned, that uh, would include some of the post-exilic psalms, and obviously the post-exilic prophets, the final prophet, probably being Malachi. But it's over a thousand years that uh, the Old Testament comes to us. Now, one of the problems is the Bible in its order, both in the, the Jewish order that uh, developed as the canon was completed, and uh, even as that was changed around somewhat within the Greek and through the, uh, the Latin Vulgate comes into our English traditions today. The problem is, is that uh, the Bible is not in a strict chronological sequence. The Old Testament is not in a strict chronological sequence in either one of those traditions. And uh, so, obviously, to deal with the, the, uh, the history that is revealed within the Old Testament, you know, we've got we've to do some cutting and pasting. 
to use a contemporary term, to be able to, to see the chronological sequence of the Bible. And there are some places where there is interpretive uh, decisions that have to be made, even as far as a chronological structure of the Bible is concerned. And I know out on the market there is a chron chronological Bible. Don't buy it. If God wanted to read it chronologically, he would have put it chronologically. He didn't. He put it in the order that we have it within the, uh, uh, within the texts that uh, have come to us. In either tradition, uh, you, will, you will understand the historical grid, but you will realize that uh, the Bible has uh, come to us in a more thematic fashion rather than a strict chronological fashion. Then we have what is known as the 400 silent years. This is the time when there was no scripture written. In fact, it's referred to that way because within Judaism, it was a recognition there was no prophetic voice. There was no prophet from Moses to Malachi until you come to John and then to Jesus. But uh, certainly there is uh, no scripture that is written during this time. And then debate, uh, and there is a debate again upon the chronology of Jesus, but uh, somewhere between uh, 6 to 4 B.C. to his death in A.D. 30 or 33, we have the, the life of Jesus upon the earth. But we need to realize that no scripture was written while Christ himself was upon the earth. Rather, the New Testament that looks back at what God had done through the coming of Jesus is written from approximately A.D. 40 to 95, a period of no more than 60 years, one generation, the New Testament is written. And it's so much easier to learn the history of the New Testament and the chronology of the New Testament because it's one generation as opposed to the Old Testament, which is a thousand years. The Old Testament, we will see, was written to the nation of Israel. The New Testament was written to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the Old Testament was written to Israel, but Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 10, it is for the church of Jesus Christ as well. And of course, that is going to get us into a lot of discussions in uh, how that which was written to Israel in the past has application to believers in the church in the present. And the, the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament is uh, the greatest hermeneutical question in, uh, uh, since the writing of the New Testament in the last 1,900 years of church history. And that's the major hermeneutical issue. And the great applicational issue of the Bible is how does the Old Testament apply to the New Testament Christian? You know, how come you got up this morning and uh, how come you had a ham and cheese omelet? Leviticus makes it clear in chapter 11, you shouldn't eat the ham. And if you follow kosher practice today, you shouldn't have ham and cheese together uh, because you're mixing foods, all right? And based upon what is in the Old Testament, a Jewish person looks at you and says, goyim of goyim, Gentile of Gentile, you know, for for eating uh, these kinds of abominable foods. And... Uh, and yet I live the side of Acts 10. I, uh, 
You know, you, you read about Peter and Peter going to the house of Cornelius, preaching the gospel. Now, uh, that's amazing that he would go to the house of Cornelius because of his Jewish background. But the amazing thing is, is after Cornelius became a Christian, Peter and the Jewish believers with him spent a few days with Cornelius in his home, eating his food. And, uh, you know, Peter had his first ham sandwich and said, wow, this is pretty good. <laughs> Thanks for the sheep from heaven, Lord. This is, I, I never realized that uh, ham tasted quite so good. And here's the thing is, is that when he got back to Jerusalem, the question wasn't, why did you preach the gospel to the Gentiles? But why did you go and stay and fellowship with those Gentiles? How could you do such a thing? And uh, so obviously, uh, the New Testament itself uh, gives us uh, some understanding of the Old Testament and how it relates to the New Testament believer. It uh, uses uh, the Old Testament, gives us some direction upon that great hermeneutical issue, but also deals with some of those practical applicational areas as well. But it flows from... Right here is the Bible. And as we have said, to the vast majority of Christians throughout church history, the Old Testament has basically been a part of the Bible that they do not know. So that is going to be the focus of our first uh, two courses to take a look at the Old Testament. And we are going to see that not only was the Old Testament before Christ, but the Old Testament was pointing very definitely to Jesus, the Messiah. That it anticipated. You finish the Old Testament and realize the story has not come to an end. The Old Testament is all anticipating what God is going to do in the future. Yes, it's a revelation of what he did in the past and what he's doing in the present, but all of that is a prelude to what God is going to do in the future. And, of course, the New Testament, as we've already seen, looks back to what God has accomplished through the coming of Jesus to the earth. But, uh, but the Old Testament certainly as in, is anticipating this coming one. And one of the things that we will be dealing with in this course very definitely as far as theology is concerned is the messianic nature of the Old Testament as it anticipates this, uh, this one whom God is going to send in the future. And uh, how, how are we to determine that and how far can we go? as uh, far as uh, seeing Jesus within the Old Testament. In fact, it was very interesting in our inaugural uh, D-Men uh, courses this last summer. One of the great issues that we dealt with, uh, even as we began reading some of the classic books on uh, preaching, was uh, how do you preach the Old Testament? And does every... Every sermon that you preach in the Old Testament have to ultimately speak about Christ. A uh, number of authors made the point, <clears throat> is it a valid Christian sermon if you could take that sermon and preach it in the Jewish uh, uh, temple down the street? What makes it a Christian sermon when you preach the Old Testament? Well, you're not quite the preaching yet, so you don't have to think about that, but realizing how important uh, the Old Testament is very, very practically, and uh, these issues that uh, we face interpretively, applicationally, and even as we get into preaching the Old Testament text. Now, when we think in terms of the Old Testament, <clears throat> the Old Testament comes to us in Blocks. That's why I refer to these as Bible blocks. And uh, again, you've got to start to appreciate the forest before you look at the trees. 
The Bible has these two major divisions, Old Testament and New Testaments. And the Old Testaments, based upon statements made in the New Testament, is referred to as having a basic three-fold division. So that there are three sections that make up the Old Testament. Now, very definitely, as we will see, the first of these, referred to as the law, is a literary unit. One author. One text. That because of its length, as in both Jewish and then Greek, Latin, and into the English tradition, had a five-fold division. But, uh, but really, the text is one literary whole, as we will see, and that is the law of Moses, the instruction, the direction, which came through the first writer of Scripture, Moses. And this encompasses what has now been divided into a five-fold division from Genesis through Deuteronomy. But, uh, but this one is in no doubt Old Testament and New Testament that this is one literary whole. Therefore, your first assignment is going to be to read Genesis to Deuteronomy together. I know it's close to 300, or a little over 300 pages. <clears throat> now think about Moses writing that much. <laughs> and we'll talk about how you're going to uh, begin by reading the whole. And then after the, uh, after the law, the second great division of the Old Testament is the prophets. The prophetic writings which follow the Torah. Men, prophets like Moses that God raised up to write like Moses. The interesting thing is, is that as you read the Torah, you, you, you realize that, that there is a narrative framework. There is a historical story that Moses is telling and within that narrative, he gives his legal material, the, 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 the law that was given at Sinai, and uh, he also gives his prophetic oracles based upon what God had said within the, uh, the law, uh, talking about the reality of its meaning for the generation in which he was speaking and anticipating what God was going to do in the future. The former and latter prophets are mosaic in that way. The former prophets continue the story, basically our narrative. And then the latter prophets, like Moses did, particularly as the Torah culminates in what we call Deuteronomy, in a very Deuteronomic fashion, speak about the meaning of the law for the generation in which they were speaking. And then like Moses, right, continuing scripture which points beyond their own generation of what God was going to do in fulfillment of his uh, covenant promises in the future. And the... the the Jewish tradition divided the prophets into the former prophets. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Here's the, here's the basic narrative of what uh, took place while Israel was in the land for approximately 800 years. And then the latter prophets. Now we see the voices that, uh, prophetic voices that emerged while Israel was in the land and particularly concentrating upon the time period just before and just 
after the exile that uh, Israel endured because of their breaking of the Mosaic Covenant. And these are the latter prophets. And the latter prophets wrote with an awareness of what they were writing as they collected, spoke of their of the events that God had led them through in their lives and the messages that God had given to them as they collected them, realizing that these books were going to, uh, to be for future generations. And really, the heart of uh, the Old Testament are these prophetic books. Now, it's very interesting that Christians don't know the Old Testament and if they know anything about the Old Testament, they tend to know the Torah, and they tend to know more of the books that are in the writings, particularly Psalms and Proverbs and uh, uh, some of the, the books like that, Daniel. The, the part of the Old Testament least known among believers are the prophets that uh, the least known part of 501 is going to be Joshua through Kings. And when we get to 502, the least known part of believers is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12, or the 12 is what we refer to them as the minor prophets. Uh, because that is where the least amount of reading and therefore, the least amount of teaching and preaching in our churches takes place is the prophets. If we get in the Old Testament at all, we get in the beginning and we get in the end. But uh, we, uh, we don't get into the, the prophets. And can we say there's great profit in getting to know the prophets? And uh, so we will look at the former prophets in this course and the latter prophets in 502. And then the third section of the Old Testament, and I've got to put this final sheet uh, here, is the, the, uh, the book of uh, uh, Chronicles. Here are the writings. The third part, the third division, which interestingly begins with uh, three lengthy books, Psalms, Job, and Proverbs. Ends with three together lengthy works that are, are exilic and post-exilic, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. That is, they are written during, and Daniel, as far as his completion is concerned, is written after the exile of Israel comes <laughs> to an end. And uh, uh, in within the, the Jewish tradition, there's a, a, a fairly uh, substantial uh, uh, recognition that these are the first three and these are the last three books of the writings. But you get to these uh, five middle books, what is known as the, the megalith of the five roles, because each one of, of these books in the in the post-biblical period, came to be read at one of the great feasts of Judaism. The Song of uh, Solomon, the Song of Songs at uh, Passover, Ruth at the uh, uh, weeks, what we now know as Pentecost, Lamentations in uh, the beginning of our calendar, August, when they... Uh, uh, grieved over the destruction of Jerusalem, Ecclesiastes at the Feast of Tabernacles, and Esther at the Feast of Purim. And, uh, and these books within Orthodox circles to this day within Judaism are read at these, at these feasts. And uh, so there, there is within Jewish tradition the fact that these five central books are in this order. But when you come to the Masoretic text, the Masoretic text moves Ruth before Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes before Lamentation. So as you get your Masoretic text, you would read these uh, five central books as Ruth, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, 
Lamentations, and Esther. So these are the, uh, the blocks. And uh, though these blocks are not inspired and therefore inerrant, when we get to the New Testament, this is the way and this is the order in which the early Jewish Christian believers read their Old Testament. And in fact, we'll talk about it on Friday from Luke 24 that uh, Jesus, as he spoke to his disciples, said that all that is written about me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, Psalms being the first book of the writings and being used as a shorthand for the, the writings, must be fulfilled because that's the way the disciples understood the Old Testament in this, uh, in this threefold division. So what I have done is uh, on that second uh, chart that uh, you have, I have uh, charted out for you. And uh, within this chart, I have followed the, the, uh, the Masoretic order. So you've got one tradition in uh, one note, which reflects what is uh, in the notes I gave you from the MacArthur Study Bible. Dr. MacArthur gives the, the feastly tradition as far as uh, the, the five books in the center of the writings are concerned. Here I give you the Masoretic order. So you can kind of put uh, MT by this chart. This is, this is the way the Masoretic text is, uh, is ordered. With the, with the Torah... And then the Nevi'im, the prophets, with the former prophets and the latter prophets. And the Ketuvim, the writings, beginning with the Psalms and going through Chronicles. It is uh, through these Hebrew terms, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, that uh, we get what the Jews refer to. They don't refer to the Old Testament they refer to this as the Tanakh. Sometimes you'll see it with an H in Jewish writings, the Tanakh. So don't go to an old don't go to a Jewish person and say, Have you read the Old Testament? The Old Testament assumes the New Testament, for they do not accept the scripture. To them it is the Tanakh. That is the the, the scriptures that we refer to as the Old Testaments. And you can see how it develops from the, uh, from the three terms that are used for the three sections of the Old Testament. So to this day, you go again, a block down Roscoe to, uh, to the temple, this is the order in which they read the Old Testament, following the Masoretic text. Now, at the time of Jesus, and continue on to today, over a three-year period within Jewish synagogues, the Torah is completely read, beginning with Genesis 1-1 and going through Deuteronomy 34. So over 156 Sabbaths, the Torah is completely read. So if you lived 60 years, you would have heard the Torah 20 times read to you if uh, you went to the synagogue every Sabbath. Then they have uh, readings which also come from the prophets. So obviously, they don't read all of the prophetic material. And then as we said at the great feasts, they read uh, Ruth through Esther. So that uh, even if you went to the most liberal of uh, Jewish synagogues, temples, if you were to go every Friday night, every Saturday, you would hear uh, over half or approximately half of the Old Testament, the Tanakh read over a, well, over a three-year period. Now, what kind of Bible reading do we do in our Christian churches when we think about that? 
So uh, uh, the reading of the scripture, as we get into the Old Testament, you'll see why even in, <clears throat> in a Judaism that has their, their eyes at this point covered to the meaning of the Old Testament text, why they put such an emphasis upon reading and rereading the Old Testament text. By the way, think what's going to happen when God unveils the eyes of, <laughs> of men and women who have heard the scripture read to them throughout their lives. And find the light goes on and how it all points to Jesus as the Messiah. It's going to be like the Apostle Paul. Um, you know, a, a Jewish person comes, becomes a believer, and it's like they're already five years ahead in their Christian life because they know so much more than a Gentile when they become a believer already from uh, this, uh, uh, this hearing of the Word of God. So there's the Old Testament, and that's the way we're going to approach it. And then you come to the New Testament. The New Testament also has a threefold structure. That we begin in the first 60% of the New Testament is that which we read, again, leaves within the New Testament. It's amazing how uh, we just don't have the same priorities as the Bible itself seems to. You know, here's 78% of the Bible that we basically ignore because we're New Testament believers. And then we tend to concentrate upon the 40%, the, the lesser amount of what is in the New Testament, and miss out on the Gospels and Acts, the historical books. And we'll talk about the fact that each one of these broadly is related to, to, to history. They're historical books or a particular time of, a type of history book that obviously gives a biography, gives a, an introduction to the, the life and uh, the meaning of the life of Jesus. Then, obviously, what we concentrate on, the epistles. And even there, we concentrate upon... The Pauline epistles. And uh, God brings another genre, another form at this point. We have the 13 Pauline letters, and they all begin the same way, Paul. And then he will speak to whomever he is writing and gives his greetings. <clears throat> we then have the non-Pauline letters. Now, I include Hebrews at this point. We will talk about Hebrews when we get there within the New Testament. But certainly, it is non-Pauline in the sense that the first word of Hebrews is not Paul. So even if Paul wrote it, he didn't follow his usual pattern of saying, Paul, to the, or to whomever, greetings. He gets right into preaching his message, if it was Paul or or someone else. Well, but certainly, therefore, it doesn't follow the exact pattern of what we see in the previous 13 uh, letters. And uh, those that follow most closely the pattern of Paul's structure is 1 Peter and 2 and 3 John and, uh, and Jude. Uh, Hebrews, James, and uh, 2 Peter and 1 John. Uh, there's debate upon whether we should think of those as letters or not. We'll talk about why they are when we get to, uh, to 601. But here are the epistles, and much like the second section of the Old Testament has uh, these uh, two divisions, the same thing within the New Testament, the second section, the epistles. We have the Pauline and the non-Pauline, and then we have the Apocalypse, the, uh, the book of Revelation, the... The, the taking of the prophetic truth that is seen within the Old Testament and uh, relating it to the church. Now, with this chart, to show you how important the Old Testament is, every one of uh, the Gospels and the book of Acts to a, a, a greater or lesser degree obviously is anchored within the Old Testament. But the... But the book of these five, which most directly speaks about this was in the Old Testament that has now been fulfilled in Jesus, the book that most explicitly anchors itself within the Old Testament is which one of these five? Matthew. Of the Pauline letters, 
Where does Paul most quote and refer back to the Old Testaments? Romans. Of the non-Pauline letters, which letter most explicitly refers back to the Old Testaments? And uh, what book, <laughs> there's only one to choose from, what book is also anchored with uh, not only direct statements, but multitudes of allusions from the Old Testament? You think the, Old Te the New Testament is trying to give us an idea, even as we read it, that maybe it is good to know the Old Testament? Matthew, as you begin to read the historical books. Romans, as you begin to read the Pauline letters. Hebrews, the non-Pauline letters, and Revelation. These are the four books of the New Testament that begin these, uh, these uh, sections. And uh, each one that begins is most explicitly anchored in what is in the Old Testament. And so we're going to take a look at these blocks of uh, material as uh, we go through 501, 502, and 601. But the focus of our course is going to be on the, the, uh, the books themselves. My wife had charted that out for you too on the New Testament. Uh, well, before we get the Bible books, there, there you go. On, this is charted out for you, and it's again threefold division and the letters being divided in the Pauline and non-Pauline letters. But uh, we're not just going to continue to, all right, read the Torah, read the prophets, read the writings, read uh, the Gospels and Acts, etc. We will come and focus, particularly within this course, upon the Bible books. These blocks, as we can see, even the literary unit of the Torah has been broken down in our traditions into Bible books. Although we'll be a little more hesitant on this on the Torah than other parts of uh, the scripture. Because what we see is within these blocks, we have the books. And uh, we assume that each book is a literary unit, a literary whole. What this means as far as a Bible book is concerned is that uh, God, by means of the Holy Spirit, directed a human author to write the book in the way we have it today within the canon that uh, behind every book of the Bible stands a human author who had a plan in mind, who had a reason for writing what is within that book. And through the author that, uh, that came to the original hearers <clears throat> as uh, the book was was read. <clears throat> now, in the uh, in the New Testament, the church, okay, the church at Colossae <clears throat> did not uh, come together one Sunday and say, oh, oh, by, "By the way, uh, Titus and Onesimus showed up this week, and they have a letter from Paul for us." You know, and they they didn't read the first couple of verses. Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ. So the church, it is Colossae. Greetings. Now come back next week and we'll take a look at the next paragraph. <clears throat> in other words, in that 20 minutes to 30 minutes, someone got up and did what? He read the whole letter. And it didn't break it up. So one of the things you'll be doing, of course, what we'll be doing is looking at the book as a whole realizing that in every book, all right, as the, as the author develops the book, he has certain divisions in mind. We start to get into the structure made up of sections and longer books, segments, 
Uh, by the way, a segment has between three to seven paragraphs uh, <clears throat> within our English tradition, of course, the segments were broken up into chapters because people couldn't not just keep reading the blocks as blocks, but even books as books. And so the, the chapters were added to say, okay, now here's a, a more workable system where you can read a book in chapters. But remember the chapters and verses today are man-made. They're not a part of the original text that came from the original authors. But segments that are made up of three to seven paragraphs, paragraphs are made up of sentences. A sentence, if <laughs> it was grammatically accurate, which again, our modern texts are not always, uh, should be a verse. Each, each verse should be a sentence. Of course, that means that Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 would be one verse because it's one sentence in the original Greek. That's why, obviously, we don't follow the exact sentence structure of uh, the Old and New Testament writers because sometimes they wrote pretty long sentences. But, uh, but basically, most verses are sentences. And then the sentences, which is the basic unit of thought, divide into clauses, phrases, and down to the words. Now, within this course, not only will we take a look at the blocks, but we will particularly seek to concentrate upon these uh, first four aspects of the books, preparing you, again, for Greek and, exegesis, uh, Greek and Hebrew exegesis, which will move you more into the paragraphs and sentences as you move down uh, within the, uh, the biblical material. So that our observation is going to be the big picture and then start dealing with the books and get familiar with the content and the structure of the books. Which, uh, uh, which, which means that uh, as we get into your assignments, you're going to be taking a look at uh, the purposes and themes and literary structure of the books. So that uh, as you read the individual books, one of the questions that you want to answer is, why was this book written? Why is this book in the canon? What is its purpose? And of course, you want to try to summarize in a sentence what is the reason. Now, this will bridge from observation into interpretation because except for a number of books like Proverbs, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, or, or uh, Luke uh, 1, 1 to 4, John chapter 20, verses uh, 30, 31, they will have explicit statements of what the purpose of the book is. Most of the books of the Bible don't have an explicit statement. And so from what you read, you will seek through what is in the text to say, all right, this is the reason for which the book was written. And within the book will be certain themes, that is terms or a narrative's persons, places, events, and non-narrative ideas that are repeated again and again within the book. All right, so you want to you wanna look for those as you are reading and uh, say, all right, what are some of the terms? What are some of the persons, places, events, ideas that are seen again and again within the book? And then assuming, of course, that we have an author behind every book, which biblically is, uh, is true, what is the structure or compositional uh, shape, literary structure or compositional shape of the text? Uh, that is, what shows is cohesion and direction because there's an author strategy. The author and the direction of the Holy Spirit has chosen what to write to fulfill his purpose. 
And so you want to look at both the organizational framework and the embedded patterns through the themes that uh, display the relationship between the whole and its parts that are fashioned into a grand design for the desired effect. Uh, sometimes when you read the, the books, and I don't ask you to do this, but to read through a book and just then write down what impressed you. Because, the, because this is the desired effect. What impressed you is what the author was seeking to impress you. And then from those impressions, you can start to go back and say, well, how did he impress me in this way? And then you can start to take a look at the, at the uh, literary contours and impat embedded patterns which leads you to those impressions to the desired effect that the biblical author wanted you to see. Then we get into interpretation, which is determining the meaning of the biblical text using the historical grammatical method. I've added uh, some, some works here. The historical part is more than just plain history. It's dealing with historical events, the what, particularly within the reading that you will do for the, uh, the courses, you will uh, have that emphasis in both the Old and the New Testament. You also deal with chronological issues. When did these things take place? Finnegan's book is a good introduction to, to a biblical chronology, the handbook of biblical chronology. Historical geography asks, where did this take place? And uh, either the old Macmillan Bible Atlas, which is now called the Carter Bible Atlas, or Beetzel's uh, Moody Atlas of Bible Lands. The Carta Bible Atlas is a, has a good emphasis upon the individual events and where they took place. Beetzel is a good introduction to the physical <laughs> land of Israel as a backdrop to where the events took place. Or culture, why they do these things. Why do they live this way? And Glau's book on the new manners and customs of Bible times, or Matthew's work on manners and customs in the Bible is uh, valuable to use. So we will concentrate more upon the history and chronology and geography and culture, which is helping us to interpret passages of Scripture. Although in dealing with certain interpretive issues, we will get into issues of broad grammar. That is how words relate to one another. Morphology, which emphasizes the study of the words themselves, syntax, how the words are put together in a, a grammatical sequence, and genre. Uh, why this kind of grammatical sequence and this type of literature? And uh, we'll be taking, taking a look at genre in 502. And then we said we have the application, which all right, after getting saturated with the particulars, knowing more of the content of the scripture, and coming to start to understand the meaning, the interpretation of the scripture, so what? How do we relate that meaning? What's its significance to present life? That is on a personal level to your own personal life. And then on a public application, that is through expository preaching. How do you show people what is in the Bible, what is meant within the Bible, and start to principalize what this means for a New Testament Christian. This is part and parcel of what takes place in the expository preaching process. And as I said, we're, gonna, we're really going to go through and hit some high points on observation, interpretation, and even take a few minutes on each book and even talk about application as far as preaching is concerned.